All right, well, with no further ado, let us introduce our speaker of the evening, uh, Neil Sahota, and I will bring up his presentation here, and just turn it over to him. I'll let him introduce himself, because I'm sure he'll do a better job than I can. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. All right. All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, doesn't sound like good. Rain got you down. It sounded like you won the lotto. How do you feel? <laughs> All right. I, contrary to what Michael thinks, I'm actually the one thing I actually hate doing is actually talking about myself. Um, just real quick, I'm one of the guys that helped create IBM Watson, um, the UN AI advisor. Uh, so you that locally know me, work with a lot of startups to help them out. You know, part-time professor at UCI, but very much a social crusader, so it's very great to have an opportunity to talk to you about how we use AI for social good. And before I actually dive into it, just out of curiosity, how many people feel like they kind of know what AI is? Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm going to give you a quiz. Is that cool? <laughs> oh, well, I would take my hand down. <laughs> well, let me, let me start off a little differently then. Um, I should probably should also mention I'm the author of this book, On the Air Revolution. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> Anyways, there's a lot of hype when it comes to AI, without a doubt. A lot of people call their products AI powered, even though they're not using AI, machine learning, or any of these things. It's a nice bump for their stock price. You know, there are some AI things out there, but it's a little confusing what could be done, not be done, where the power is, what's new. So I thought I'd start off by welcoming you to reality. There's the age old question, can a machine create, could it create art? Well, there's a guy named Ross Goodwin right out of Los Angeles that attempted to do that. So he tried to create an AI that could write film scripts. Well, let's see what happened. All right, you can't tell me that. Yeah, I'm coming to that thing. I don't want to be honest with you. You don't have to be a doctor. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're talking about. I just wanted to tell you that I was much better. think? Do you think uh, AI can create art? Can it be creative? Imagine. Somewhat. Well, depending on how much percentage, uh, how many percentage. It's, I'll help you guys out. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> how many people say yes? And how many people say no? So it looks like about two-thirds say yes. Well, you didn't say good art. Uh, art, art is very subjective, but after looking at this video, we know the answer is actually no. Right now, actually, it can't do that. So the question you might be thinking is, what, what, we what? Was this a trick? How, how did Benjamin do that, right? Well, one thing we've learned is that we have to be able to teach the AI, we have to be able to train it up. But we can only teach AI things that are commoditized. Turns out when it comes to movies, there's only 12 archetypes. Every movie ever made fits into one of those 12 archetypes. So you teach the A those 12 archetypes, you teach it a little about characterization, about dialogue, and you have Sunspring, right? If you actually want to see the whole thing, it's nine minutes long, it's on YouTube. However, what didn't even get shared over here is this 
short film has actually won some uh, filmmaking awards. It's actually won awards like at the Toronto Film Festival and the London Film Festival. This was the AI's first attempt at actually writing a film. One thing we know about machines, the more they do, the better they get. So let's take a look at what Benjamin does on his 25th film script. So, before I, I kind of jump more into it, I want to level set for a second, because I know there's a lot of fear out there. I hear a lot of people kind of fear mongering. Are there concerns about the technology? Absolutely. Should we be worried about it taking over the world, eradicating humanity? No, no. Uh, at this point, AI only can do whatever we tell it to do, can only do what it's trained to do, and it's very passive. So all these apocalyptic things that we keep hearing about or concerned about, probably not gonna happen. But do we have to worry about a machine making a recommendation or a decision that'll impact human lives? Yes, we absolutely do that because we are entrusting machines with more and more data. If you look at the Internet of Things, IoT, that's really generating data for machine consumption, not human consumption. So we have to be a little part philosophical, understand how AI could be used or misused. So I definitely don't want to underscore that point. I also want to take a second to just define what AI is because there's a lot of definitions floating out there and it's a bit of a moving target. So essentially AI is a machine that can do some sort of low level work that requires some level of cognition without human supervision. So typically we look at three things. The first is this concept of machine learning. So AI really isn't programmed. We're not saying here the algorithms. What we do is we treat it like it's a three-year-old kid and we want to teach it a new skill. So we give it something we call ground truth, which are the rules on how to make decisions. Then we give the AI lots and lots of data because that's the fuel for the AI to learn. So as it learns, it starts making connections and associations. We teach it some concepts. We then let it try to do things. And then we have our domain experts come in and correct the AI. So, hey, AI, good job, this is right, but this one here is wrong. He said it was this, really should have been this. And that's how it, it, it grows, it learns. And it goes from three-year-old to PhD in a few weeks, depending on how complex or whatever we're working on is. So you guys are familiar with DeepMind's AlphaGo? Sort of, anyone play the game Go? A few people. It's considered one of the most complex games invented ever by humans. So unlike chess, where every time you have a chess move, there's 100 moves and 100 subsequent moves. In Go, for the first move, there's over 100,000 subsequent moves. And then from each of those moves, there's over 100,000 more. So you can't brute force attack and just calculate probabilities. We don't have enough computing power. And the game is more about feel and instinct as well. So how do you teach a machine to play this game? Well, they started with the ground truth. They gave AlphaGo the rule book for the game. Okay, now we know how to make, what the rules are for decisions or how to make moves. Then they had it watch 10,000 hours of people playing the game. So they didn't say these are good players, these are bad players, good strategies, whatever. Just watch, learn, see what they do, make some inferences. Then they had AlphaGo play itself one million times. And we call this reinforcement learning. So AlphaGo could experiment with strategies, other kinds of things, and try and master the game. Well, it took AlphaGo one week to play itself a million times, and then they entered it into the Go tournament. So the hope was to one day beat the Go champion. The current Go champion was the, the greatest in over a century. They thought they'd be able to beat that player by 2022. They did it in 2016. Testament how fast the machine learns. But then DeepMind thought about this. It's like, look, if data is really important and we gotta be concerned about bias, did we teach AlphaGo bad things by having it watch humans play the game? What do you guys think? Is there bias in the way we play? A game? I'm gonna assume that music is a yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they went out and created AlphaGo Zero. And this time they just gave AlphaGo Zero the rule book and said this is the ground truth. 
and never let AlphaGo watch, a hum watch a, any humans play. They basically had it play itself to learn and teach. Once they felt AlphaGo Zero had uh, mastered the game, they had, a, had it play AlphaGo. So they played 100 times. Guess what the outcome was? Times. That's right, AlphaGo 0, 100, AlphaGo 0. <laughs> so it looks like maybe AlphaGo learned some bad habits from us humans, so maybe a little bias in how we play. So then they just uh, take it a step further with the machine learning aspect. They decided, like, could AlphaGo 0 become a grandmaster in the machine league of chess? So they just told AlphaGo 0, here's the rules for chess. Just figure out how to play and become a grandmaster. So, you know, AlphaGo Zero basically played itself, learned things, entered the machine league, and eventually became the grand machine master of chess. You know how long it took AlphaGo Zero to do that? A week. Hours. Four hours. That's the power of machine learning, right? We're not programming the machines they actually learn. That's one. Second is the ability to understand natural language. Think about how you talk. Is that proper English? <laughs> Who uses slang? <laughs> Idiom, jargon, right? If I tell you guys that I'm feeling blue because it's raining cats and dogs, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> What does a machine think? Neil is physically the color blue because small animals are falling from the sky? <laughs> yeah, that does not compute, right? Why do we fill in forms or fill out forms? Why do we park on driveways? Why do we drive on parkways, right? These are confusing concepts for machines. But when it comes to AI, it's not looking at keywords. It's looking at connotation and context. It's trying to understand the intent behind the conversation and not taking things as a literal truth. Just consider this for example, right? France. What's the first thing when I, you, pops into your head when I say France? Paris. Paris, red wine, country, baguettes, cheese, wine, wine Eiffel Tower. Right? If you ask a machine what's, what's France, what's it going to think? country in the European Union, 50 million population, 30 million square kilometers, right? It's, we don't think the same way. And so we have to teach these concepts, these things that we associate with France to the machine so it can actually do this. This is really important because the third element is, for AI, is that it has the ability to interact like it's another person. Think about that for a second. How many people have Alexa? You guys like your Alexa? I see some people nodding, some people like, no, no, no way. Why don't you like the Alexa? To machine. Never does what you ask her to do. Never ask what you, you never does what it asks you to do, all right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, Alexa is really looking at keywords, right? And it, it doesn't have any persistent memory. So you can say like, okay, Alexa, turn down the volume, and it will. And you're like, well, turn it down more, and I'll be like, what? You <laughs> know, yeah. it doesn't remember that. With AI, it's actually like having a conversation. I don't have to go and say, hey, Alexa, turn down the lights. I can just say, whoa, it's bright in here. Boom, AI would say, okay, dim the lights. I understand what you're trying to say. Might say like, hey, is this, and it might come back and say, hey, is this okay? You want me to dim it down some more? Is it too dark? You know, did you, did you just come from the optometrist? You know, I don't know, I could have a conversation with you. And that's what we're seeing. Rather than go out into a search engine and try and buy a bicycle and look at 50 bazillion web pages, we can talk to an AI that knows about bikes. Say, hey, I want to buy a bike. Which one should I get? It's going to be like, yo, why do you want one? Right? I want to get back in shape. All right. How many think you'll ride it? Uh, four or five times a week, about an hour a time. And where will you ride your bike? Well, part of the neighborhood. Great, here's the right bike for you. See? Conversation with the best friend that happens to know about bikes. And I emphasize best friend because while the AI is seeking more information from me, 
to make a good recommendation. It's also trying to use information it might know about me that's not asking about. For example, it might go like, you know, Neil says four or five times a week, but he's a pretty busy guy, so it's like once a week. And he doesn't like to spend money on stuff, so probably all the expensive stuff is off the table. That's why it's like a best friend. So it's these three things that really power AI for us. And so what can we actually do with that? Well, what happens when you take a dog to a tech conference? Does anybody recognize anything special about this dog? Yeah, it's a service dog. It's a C&I dog. So there's a nonprofit called Guiding Eyes that looks at puppies, trains the dogs, and tries to match them with a human and hope they, they stick together, right? I mean, it's months of work. You know what their success rate is? Ah, you heard it before. Good memory. <laughs> you, heard it, you heard it very recently. <laughs> yeah, 30%. That, that's great if you're a baseball player, but we're trying to help people that are vision impaired. So, you know, they came and said, hey, we want to use AI, can, can we do something? And I'm like, uh, AI and dogs? I, I don't know. Let's talk about it. Maybe we'll figure something out. Turns out there's actually a lot of information about dog psychology. And so we were able to leverage that in some other things, and now they have a working AI that can look at a puppy as young as seven days old, and based on the way it interacts with other puppies and dogs, figure out if it has the mental capability to be a good CNI dog. And if so, works with the humans to devise a personalized doggy training curriculum to train the dog. And once that's done, the AI psychoanalyzes the dog, does a psychographic profile across 56 personality traits, and then looks at the pool of humans and does the exact same thing, and then finds the best match between dog and human. So other than that guy, what's their success rate now? 60%. Worse? Worse? No, it's 80, 81%. And it's going to get better the more the AI does. Would you ever imagine that an AI could help us train CNI dogs? I left my school project. What's this guy talking about? So. Well, if it'll help CMI dogs, what can you do about training software engineers? <laughs> I, I'm not going to go there at an ACM meeting. <laughs> but this, this is the, this, these, we have a whole new set of capabilities. AI brings a whole new set of tools for us that we're just starting to, to understand. I'm going to save questions till, till the end. So, we know AI is in action. I can tell you the Watson Jeopardy Challenge was almost nine years ago. There's not a sector of industry out there that I know where somebody is not doing something with AI, from education to legal services to life sciences and healthcare, the media to sports, you name it, someone's doing something, even in wine. There's a bunch of stuff going on in the wine industry, All right? I don't think I have to sell you guys on, hey, there's a great opportunity here, but I will tell you this, that AI is not the future. It's very much the present, right? And I've told a lot of people, unfortunately, that if you're thinking about trying to do something with AI right now, you're probably about three years behind the curve. But there's plenty of leapfrog opportunities out there. And one very so near, near so dear so to my heart, and the main theme of my talk tonight, is that AI is more than dancing robots and digital assistants that sometimes work well or sometimes don't. It can be a real force for social good. And that's something that I think that we tend to overlook, right? There's, especially among Generation Z, very much a strong trend towards social enterprise, social entrepreneurship. So how many people are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? So a few, that's, that's good. I'm gonna have to talk to my, my UN buddies about the marketing here. For those of you that are not familiar, and to be honest, most people are not, in 2015, the member nations of the UN voted on 17 goals they want to accomplish by 2035 to make the world a better place. No poverty, zero hunger, 
quality education, access to health care. I, I won't read them all to you, but very big goals, very powerful goals, very impactful goals, yeah? How do you think we're doing? Right, we're four years into it. We're limping. <laughs> Trudging. Trudging, unfortunately very much so. Well, one of the big challenges is that while well, the member nations aspire to these big challenges, the, the backing in terms of people and funding and other types of resources has not been as strong. So the UN conservatively estimates we are about $7 trillion short every year on trying to make these goals a reality. The estimate in some places is as high as $20 trillion a year. So what can we do about that? Because right, that, that's a pretty sizable gap, so probably we should just quit, right? Come on, that's not what we do as, as good people, right? We like to rise to challenges, yeah? Maybe there's an answer in technology. Maybe technology can help us bridge some of this gap. So we have whole new tools in play like artificial intelligence and VR and blockchain and quantum. So one of the things that is brought out of this was the uh, first time I gave a keynote to the UN, I was actually told, mm, just so you know, these guys think it's Terminator time. AIs, they think it's gonna rise up, conquer the world, destroy humanity. So good luck with your talk. So okay, good to know. Um, so I really emphasize my talk a little bit on what is AI, but more importantly, how it can be used for public service, for social good. And that night at a reception, I was approached by several of the UN leadership, and they said, your talk was actually very inspiring, but more importantly, you got us to think, which was good, because that was my goal. But you made us think that we can actually do something. We can actually do good with this. We just don't know how or how to get started. Could you help us? We want to strike while the iron's hot. So even to my amazement, because they are a large bureaucratic organization, they move very swiftly on it. And we wound up starting something that we call AI for Good. And AI for Good is bringing, building a community and bringing people together in partnership to donate their time, their money, their equipment to work on projects to help make the sustainable goal, development goals a reality. And in three years of spooling this up, we have 116 active projects going on today. Right, all volunteer. Pretty amazing. We now host an annual summit to report out on these projects, but also to increase our community building. And to help just generally build the awareness, create opportunities again for social entrepreneurship, social enterprise. But to also counteract that, that fear factor and show that this tool could be used for good. Because AI, like every technology, is just a tool. You know, it's a hammer. We can use it to create, or we can use it to destroy, but we have to create the right mindset if we want to create. So one thing I'm very happy to announce is that the you know, UN and, and I have been talking about this for a while, yeah. but uh, with the support of Governor Gavin Newsom, um, a lot of the state leadership, a lot of the big companies in California. It looks like we'll actually be hosting this uh, conference next year in Orange County in September of 2020. Pretty cool? Yes. I'm not feeling the excitement. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell them to send it to LA. <laughs> so I can tell you, the governor and a lot of people are very excited about this. This is a huge opportunity for us and to help you know, sh not just showcase the power of Orange County and what's going on here, but to hopefully turn Orange County to a hub for tech for good, as like I like to call it. But enough about me and all that. I'm going to show you what we can do with AI for social good, because I believe there's a true partnership. I don't believe in the Terminator future. I believe more in a cyborg future. But I, that means a partnership between machine and human beings. And great example of that, since I talked about seeing eye dogs, is seeing.ai. Anybody ever hear of them? 
So they work in partnership with Microsoft to try and empower, again, vision impaired people. So I'm going to play a quick video showcasing what they do. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny, your top right, three feet away, describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope, Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box, or a room entrance, Conference 2005, or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. Disagreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, Use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Haven microwave full on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close-up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. What do you guys, what do you guys think about that? Is it available on uh, Google Store and, and or App Store? I would, I would imagine. I can admit that I don't use the app, but uh, I, know I, I, know, I, know, I know it's available. Yeah, I know it's available, yeah. Right, this, this is only the start, right? If you talk about vision impairment, they've also done experimental surgeries now where they've been able to implant digital cameras into a blind person's eyes and transmit the signal into the brain. The images are black and white and they're fuzzy, but blind people can actually see, right? It's very costly, but again, over time, they'll probably perfect it. But again, this very much the power at our fingertips. And we can, again, not say it's wrong to commercialize or anything like that, but as people are making money, they can also do social good. But if you want to talk straight up social good, there's two words, Snotbot. Who's heard of Snotbot? Well, you guys for sure. <laughs> Hashtag Snotbot. So what you, this picture you see, that's actually Snotbot in action. And so what it actually is, is a combination of drone technology with AI and what they, it does is it actually will fly out and follow a whale pod. And when one of the whales rises up to blow its nose, so to speak, the drone swoops in and has petri dishes on it and collects the whale mucus. That whale mucus is then analyzed by an AI. And so it's looking at the water content, the parasites, the algae, the crustaceans, all these things, and trying to stitch together a picture of how healthy that local ocean ecosystem actually is. So very, very low tech. It's used by Ocean Health Alliance. The question was asked, did you have to use AI and all these things to do that? And they said, if we tried to do this ourselves, which we've never done before, we probably have to get a boat, staff it with 12 to 14 people, go out, collect all these samples and analyze it. It would probably take us seven days with that team to the work of what Snapbot does in one hour. Pretty powerful. Would you imagine that we could use AI to do something like this for ocean health? That we could stitch together these disparate data points or puzzle pieces about the ocean into a cohesive picture? It's the power of AI, right? To be able to crunch through millions and millions of different data points like that. Agriculture is another big area that's getting uh, impacted by AI. 
you know, even in Africa, there's Project Lucy, where they're available now to use AI to figure out things like, well, if we move the seeds over by three millimeters when we plant them, we can actually improve crop yield by 30%. If we do these things, we can reduce the water usage to grow the plants. If we plant this type of plant, we can maximize the lifetime of the crop soil. There's a lot of things going on. So just in the interest of time, I'm gonna just skip this video. But even things like, you know, we've been a civilization of farmers for over 50,000 years, we're finding tools like AI can even help us predict insect infestation it's, uh, it's pretty amazing stuff for social good because one of the SDGs, remember, is zero hunger. And then there's advancing health care. So one of the, I think, the, one of the biggest pioneers actually is China in using AI for med tech. So I'm actually going to play a news clip showing what they're doing. <laughs> At Shenzhen No. 6 People's Hospital, Dr. Cheng Chunsheng is conducting a gastroscopy for a patient. During the procedure, dozens of images are being taken of the esophagus to look for cancer. Esophageal cancer is one of the deadliest cancers in China. Usually, the accuracy of the diagnosis relies on the doctor's personal experience and skill. This is where an AI system becomes quite helpful. For example, we have 50 images. The AI system will analyze them all and select five pictures showing a high possibility of cancer. Then I check the selected images directly to make a final diagnosis. It's faster and more efficient. The system is called Li, developed by Chinese internet giant Tencent. Its database comes from cancer diagnosis information from first-class hospitals in China. Since its trial use began in June 2017, it has served 400,000 patients. We established a joint program with Tencent to provide necessary data. Now the accuracy of early detection of esophageal cancer has reached 90%, roughly the same level of diagnosis made by human doctors. This is one of the first hospitals in China to put such an intelligent system under pilot trial for clinical testing. Last November, China announced a plan to build a national platform for AI diagnostic medical imaging. Developers say they are trying to enlarge the system's database and expand its coverage in China. AI is able to learn from lots of data. That's what humans can't do. We hope the system can reach out to remote areas and grassroots hospitals in China, where patients can get a diagnosis as accurate as in first-class hospitals in big cities. So far, the system has been used for detection of esophageal and lung cancer, as well as diabetes. It's expected to cover the 10 deadliest cancers in China in the future. Go to the CGTN, Shenzhen. So I want you to not just be, well, that's pretty cool stuff and value, but big takeaway is they're not trying to place doctors or nurses. What they're actually trying to do is, through this technology, give them more tools to use. But those doctors that are in the, or sorry, those hospitals that are in the rural areas, help them be able to improve their medical quality up so that they can give the same kind of service as a big city hospital. Right, that's pretty powerful. We're, we're all lucky, we live in Orange County, we have access to that, right? But if you're in parts of the Midwest where the closest doctor might be 60 miles away, or if you're in Africa, there's only one doctor for every 2,000 people, and that might, guy might be 200 kilometers away, what do we do, right? How we bridge that gap? Because one of the SDGs is access to healthcare. Anybody recognize this young gentleman? Who, who is he? Richard Branson. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him recently. He invited me out to his private island because he wants to talk about how they can use AI for ocean stewardship. And so he owns an island called Necker Island. He bought it apparently in 78 and it got ravaged by Hurricane Irma. 
and so I saw some of the construction or reconstruction going on on the island and these are pictures of some of the damage right and you know I actually told them about my own experience because I've unfortunately had three experiences with hurricanes um, the most recent being Typhoon U2 so I was actually in Saipan I was actually in like the center over here when the hurricane hit and it absolutely ravaged the land you can see by just by the pictures what happened they were without power and water for over a month right i mean the airport was destroyed you know people like me were waiting for boats to come in to take us to guam because the government's like we can't take care of our own people are we going to take care of these tourists right do you think ai can help us here yes. absolutely how what So good, so we can do a lot with disaster predictions and that the weather predictions with planning, maybe even some prevention, right? And this, this is really how it works. So you want to use AI, we look at a problem, we try and generate solutions out of it, just like we kind of me brainstormed here. And when you talk about natural disaster recovery or natural disasters, which we unfortunately know too well in California, there's lots of things we can use AI for. You know, we can use it for disaster recovery. We can have a dro drones flying around with AI looking at the camera data to see if we can find survivors. You know, we can look at it to help provide healthcare services. We actually have developed little self-contained tablets that if people have access to them, they can actually help diagnose and administer simple healthcare for injuries or illnesses. Right? You can even use the camera to help look at what's going on, help the AI do the assessment. We could do it in terms of even our planning. If we think we know where the hurricane might hit or the highly likely places where it might hit, in advance we can send food, water, other supplies to that area so that if it does happen, the survivors are already equipped. Right? You look at the utilities. I don't know how many people remember Hurricane Sandy. And it was a long time ago, eight years. I'm originally from New York, which is what I remember. Right? You think about New York City, right? The most populous city in the US, old, very modern. Uh, there were some of the parts of the city were without power and water for three weeks. And everyone was like, How on earth could this happen? You were supposed to have done all this planning. Well they did. They did tons of planning. They had extra people available, they had extra equipment available, they were ready to go wherever they needed to go to try and restore services. But no one in the room ever thought about the logistics. Where are power transformers located? Underground. Underground or in the middle of nowhere. Right? Nobody wants to live next to a transformer. I don't mean the Michael Bay kind. So they had all the stuff, but the problem was the only way to get to a lot of these places was these old dirt roads, and they were all washed out. Couldn't get the, the people, could not get the equipment to the locations. So they had to wait for the stuff to recede. All right, could an AI have helped us identify that gap in our thinking? Quite possibly. Could an AI help us figure out how to overcome that gap? What do you think about that? Do you think that's possible? Has anyone ever heard of generative design? People are now using AI, particularly in manufacturing or in cases like this, to rather than just say like, you know, I want to build this material or I want to do this, just say these are the parameters of what I want to try and do. This is the outcome I'm looking for. And they let the AI generate thousands of options and then triage the options to so which ones are probably the most feasible. Especially in manufacturing, AI is now designing all new types of materials we never thought of that can be 3D printed. And more importantly, we're now using it for space fabrication because we've learned we can actually fabricate materials in space. We can't fabricate on Earth because of gravity. 
So there's a lot of things we can do for disaster recovery, disaster planning, disaster prevention, as well as generating whole new options or looking at things that we may not be thinking about. But we have a challenge, right? This is not a magic bullet. We need data, we need domain experts. But we also kind of have to rethink the way that we think. AI is called the third generation of computing for good reason. It's a whole new set of capabilities, and we're used to computers that run on programs. All right, we give it the instructions, we give the exception pass, it just follows those steps. So we've gotten to using of machines as automation. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we're really unlocking 20 to 30% of the power or value of AI. But we need to think about innovation how we can unlock the full potential of AI. So the difference, automation, we're thinking about trying to make something that exists, a product, a system, a process, faster, cheaper, or with less errors. Innovation, however, is we want to change that product, process, or system to find a new, better way of doing it. And that's the main hurdle most of us, most organizations have, is how do we really be innovative thinkers with AI? Well, let's take a look at an example. There's very little sound in this video, but I want you to watch what's happening. Did you guys see what happened? What happened? He was able to control a artificial limb, artificial hand, essentially with his mind. <laughs> right? How did he do that? Well, if you look at his arm over here, he's wearing a sensor. So even though you've lost your, your, your hand or part of your arm or even your leg, we know the brain can still send signals to the body to try and manipulate something that may not be there. So looking at muscles, tendons, all these things, an AI can actually look at all these points and try and interpret and learn what these signals actually mean and over time become good at it. That's meaning that people that have lost a limb can actually get their mobility restored, at least partially. Is that automation or innovation? Oops. Gotta pick one. Innovation. <laughs> yes, thank you. Not a trick question, yeah. right? Outside of science fiction movies and books, did you think something like this would ever be possible? Well, right? This isn't the future. People are doing this. People are looking more at brain waves. Some people are looking more at muscle functions, all these kinds of things. But will this become more, become even better and perfected? Will it become more accessible, hopefully cheaper? Absolutely. But this is the path that we're actually on. This is AI and AI for social good, or in this case, social enterprise. So there's a lot of examples out there and I could spend hours and hours sharing with you, but we see a lot of stuff all over the place. You know, there's, a, I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know if, if any of you know about foster kids, but they actually suffer from high, high abuse rates from their foster parents. So uh, a group in Pennsylvania called Allegheny has started, they created an AI to see if they can detect the risk of a child for abuse from foster parents. So what's the likelihood it might happen to try and protect the kids? There's a project around Africa, what they call African orphan, orphan crops. So they're basically looking at genomics and saying a lot of the crops that have been de devastated or may even become extinct in Africa because of climate change, could they be resurrected? And could they be grown in either a different part of the continent or a different continent entirely? And is this even possible? Does anybody drink Malbec wine? You know where that grape is from? It's in Argentina now, but it's originally from France. But they actually can't grow it in France because the topsoil no longer can support it. Plus the weather has changed. So there's opportunities like that. But we're looking at things like AI for opioid screening, AI to help combat 
pollution and wear and tear on our roads. There's an organization that created a tool called PAUSE, where an AI actually tries to anticipate where uh, poachers will be and alert the authorities so they can change either their, their plans, their, uh, their, their, their uh, I, forget, I forget the term, their, the way they monitor, so they can actually catch the poachers before they actually poach the animals. And of course, who recognizes that young uh, puppet in the lower right hand corner? Elmo, yeah. Sesame Street is using AI to create individualized edu educational programs for children because they realize that children all learn in different ways. So there's a lot, a lot that can be done. I know you're looking at me, well that's some cool stuff, but I'm not a smart AI engineer, or machine learnist, or roboticist, so what can I do about it, right? Well you can go back to school for six years, get a PhD, that work? No? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to be any of those things. AI is not about coding despite what that's what people think. AI is very much about the data. Do you have the data? Is it good data? It's about experimenting, a little bit of coding. What we really need are people that understand problems, understand the pain points that are going on with the work we're trying to do either get the data or have access to the data to try and figure something out, to think differently. So my magic formula is this. It's not problem solution, it's problem opportunity solution. When it comes to AI, we don't put together a set of requirements and let the smart IT guys go off, do the design, do the build, the testing, and we see what happens. It's very much yin and yang, we're merged together. So first thing we gotta do is start on the business side of the house. What is exactly the problem? What are we, what are we trying to solve here? What, what's the issue and why? What's causing that issue? And marry that to domain expertise, that's how we create the opportunity. Once we have the opportunity, we partner up with smart technologists who help us understand what these capabilities potentially are and the feasibility of actually trying to do something and that's how we create a solution. That's not rocket science, right? But it's actually very hard for us to do that because we're not used to thinking this way. So focus on the problem. Data, unfortunately data is the new oil. It can be hard to get the data. So do you have it? Can you manufacture it? Can you license it? Or could you use synthetic data? Which means you kind of manufacture the data even though it's not real. Banks do that a lot for fraud detection, by the way because they definitely don't want a lot of data about fraud. And then it's about the training. So what are, is your ground truth? Who are your domain experts? How do you train the AI? You could have five organizations trying to do the exact same thing. Each build their own AI, and each AI will probably come out with some different recommendation or answer for you, even in social good. So it means we gotta be really careful about bias because we all have our own slants based on the way we grow up, our education. But we have to be really careful about implicit bias, the things that we may not see. So for example, Google built a hate speech detector. Right? They wanted to jump ahead of this and try and prevent all these things from happening or going too far. Guess what happened? Google's hate speech detector turned out to be racist little flaw in their uh, in their training right they had to shut it down another issue Google Vision great visual imaging great, great visual recognition tool very much but they had a problem a couple of years ago where it was very good at identifying white men but not women or other races or nationalities is Google racist no but probably what happened was when they were training it teach the concept of a person, right? Different faces, glasses, hairstyles, that kind of stuff. The guys that were working on it probably used pictures of themselves and they were probably mostly white men. So unfortunately overlooked that. Very, that's why it's very important to have diversity and, inclu and inclusion in the way we train AI. So how do we do this? It's really about thinking differently, right? Understanding that we have all these new capabilities in our hands, 
right? Look, we can use machines to train dogs, CNI dogs. We can use AI to look at ocean health. So we have to be able to kind of unwind the way we've been taught to leverage these capabilities, but we also have to understand that machines think differently as a whole. Right? If you think about self-driving cars, the first self-driving cars used cameras because we use our eyes to drive, right? We rely on vision. And then one day, a guy on autopilot in his Tesla, well, guess what happened, right? He was busy watching Harry Potter, didn't see a truck that wiped out 300 yards ahead of him on the highway, and neither did the Tesla. Ran right through the truck bed, ripped the top of the car off. Everyone was like, how in the world did this happen? Well, it was a cloudy day, and the truck bed was white. So it blended into the background. The camera never picked it up. Had they been using radar, had they been using LIDAR, it would never have happened. We can't drive that way, but a machine can. In fact, we know we can hear that little kid about to run across the street before we see the little kid. We can't drive with our ears, but a machine can. So we have to make sure we understand what those capabilities are and how we can maximize the value out of them. So the mindset, you want to do social good, you want to do social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, you can't think of this technology, this tool as a threat. You have to think of it as an opportunity. What is that opportunity? What's that problem and how can you create an opportunity out of it? So that's my challenge to all of you guys. You guys have an amazing chance to shape the future. You can be drivers, not passengers, in where we're going. And the tools that get created, the mindset that we need to build from a community standpoint, even the future of work, the skills and the knowledge that are needed for jobs that are probably only six years out. So are you willing to take that challenge? Yes. Okay, one guy is. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll count that 2% as a win. <laughs> So with that, I thank you very much, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Neil. Uh, before we guys thank you with the certificate of appreciation. Oh, thank you. Uh, Included with all of your other awards that you've received. Uh, we would very much appreciate you speaking to the ACM tonight. My pleasure. And traditionally, our first question goes to uh, Windsor, representing the um, IEEE Computer Society. Oh, um, oh. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you are IEEE members? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, that was a hard one. <laughs> uh, before the actual questions, uh, we, we will have open forum for questions until 8.30, and at that point uh, we need to disband and, and uh, clean up the facility. So um, the field is now open for questions, and Neil is a bell. Hi, Neil. I have, I have a few questions. So let's start with uh, how you said you worked on uh, IBM Watson. Can you explain to us how, how Watson is different than the AI, whether it uses a different kind of neural network? So DeepMind, his question is, can you talk a little bit about the differences between the AI like technologies and platforms like DeepMind and IBM Watson? So DeepMind for like AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero are very based on probabilistic models. So they're not trying to calculate every move, but they're trying to think about strategy and high quality moves one or two out that might yield good benefits. So they're very focused, I'll call it more, on that defined space because they're playing a game. So if there's you know, zillions or gigabillions of moves, it's still a finite set. Watson is actually based on the concept of observation hypotheses and then testing the hypotheses. So when you ask Watson a question, it's not looking up an answer because you actually ask Watson a question it doesn't, nobody knows the answer to. What it actually does is it'll very much try and generate millions upon millions of hypotheses. And then based on what it knows, its experience, other things, 
use that evidence to either increase the likelihood that the hypothesis is true or decrease the likelihood that the hypothesis is true. And so what it, what it winds up is it sorts through all these billions of hypotheses and then looks at the top three and says, are any of these actually viable or realistic? But in doing this, it's actually crunching through hundreds of millions of data points and millions of variables to try and figure that out. So that's a very high level answer to your question. Um, but the one I can't go into some of the guts of this because they're, they're secrets, but that's just a different way that they're thinking. But that's one of the reasons why Watson is better when it comes to understanding things like natural language, whereas deep minds like AlphaGo is much better at just the, the raw mechanics or the likelihood of an outcome. I think I'd be able to be happy to hear that. He was, so he was asking about uh, AI and healthcare and some of the work that IBM Watson Health has done. Um, I I think there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare, just generally speaking. I, I don't know how much how many people are here actually work in healthcare. So quite a few. So it, it's one where there's obviously a lot of need and opportunity, but medical information doubles about every four years now. And doctors have even acknowledged that they have less than five hours a month to even try and read the latest medical journals. So it's, it's tough for them to keep up with the latest advancements or knowledge clinical trials. So a lot of people look and when they look at like IBM Watson, could it help be kind of a, kind of that research tool or help with some basic diagnosis, you know, for the doctors and nurses? And the, obviously the answer is yes. But they're also looking at things like, could this be a thing like a kind of a, a, a transcriber? So if you had a patient like in the ER, you know, it's a tense situation, you got some doctors, nurses running around asking questions, could you have a little AI system in the background kind of listening in, maybe even helping to observe the patient, notating what questions the doctors are asking, seeing so they get what symptoms going on. But in the background saying like, okay, based on the symptoms we know, these are the likelihood diagnoses, but then on the symptoms we're not seeing, use that to also kind of triage to come up with something more robust in terms of a likely diagnosis. So a lot of like inf real time information processing like that. Then there's a lot of work going on with MRI, x-ray reading. Um, there's a, I don't know if I actually should mention this, but there's a startup that's using, uh, trying to use invas uninvasive procedures to try and get medical information. And they're trying to say, could we uh, use like Watson to help us actually do that? The answer is, is it technically it's possible, but the problem that they have is they can't do it. They don't have enough data. And that's actually the common problem when it comes to healthcare is often not enough data available to train the AI. So without that fuel, you can't do much. So if you want to teach like Watson to read, to try to detect early stage cancer in lungs from x-rays, you need to have lots of data to do that. All right, healthy lungs, lungs that are infected with cancer, but then there's different forms of cancer, different stages, all these types of things. You, you literally need tens of thousands of x-rays to do that, and a lot of institutions just don't have that data available. So it's, it's um, the unfortunate challenge that we have right now is data accessibility. Because we know in the aggregate, we probably have the data to do this, but people don't want to share. And the World Health Organization is actively trying to create a health repository. So stripped of PHI, but basically a big giant public database with a lot of this information that clinicians, physicians, researchers could use to try and actually do some of these things in the hopes of advancing medicine. But participation has been lackluster so far. So. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. I, I learned greatly about it. Uh, I work in government and um, I try to use 
automation, and I would like to use AI, but I don't know if the um, opportunity that I see at my job, if that applies to AI or is it um, automation? And what I do is that I, um, I'm in charge of all the affordable housing in one a jurisdiction. And they have different rent limits, utilities, and there are a lot of data associated with affordable housing um, projects throughout the city. So is that something that I can use AI or is it purely automation? I'll, I'll give you the typical answer, answer maybe. <laughs> I would probably have to know probably a little bit more. I'm happy to chat with you about that. I just want to, just two points of clarification. One, there's nothing wrong with automation. There's still value from that, right? So don't, don't get me wrong. Innovation creates more, more value, but doesn't mean we should not do automation. Second, while AI is a very powerful tool, we don't need to use it for everything, right? We should use it when it actually makes sense. Right, so, sometimes, you know, the cast is much better than some wild stem cell therapy. I just I like to use that example. So don't think of AI as a magic bullet solution, but there might be an opportunity to do something uh, with what you're talking about, because there's actually a lot of use of AI to help homeless people. And I know a lot of real estate companies actually use AI in terms of land development and property management. So there might be something where you just need more details, but like I said, I'm happy to chat with you about that. Yeah. That, that is a great question. So he was asking like, you know, why, why does the AI have to see so many more images than a human doctor to come proficient? One has to do with truth and trust in the technology. What's the acceptable failure rate of an airplane? See a lot of people say zero. Is that possible? Come on, IEEE members, you know, <laughs> right? It's a, there's a number, it's a really, really small number. There is a number. And the, that's the, the challenge that we have is people expect the machine to be different, and, or sorry, be perfect. And that's not gonna be happening, but especially in healthcare, we know that we're talking about people's lives, and all it takes is one bad incident to derail the whole thing, no matter how much value actually gets created. So we're overly cautious as a result, so we want a lot of data. The second challenge is, unfortunately, we don't know what's the best data to use to teach. And so we're just throwing a lot of big data at something rather than kind of curating and triaging that data and say, ah, of these 50,000 x-rays, we actually only need these 700 to adequately teach the machine. And that's actually a problem that some, a lot of people are actually working on to say, can we figure that out? Because if you want to teach like an AI a language, uh, it essentially has to hear, if I remember correctly, 100 million words. Could be a lot of the words will be repeated over and over again, but when it hears 100 million words, it gets, it's very proficient in that language. A human child only needs 15 million, right? So we have to kind of understand it's, it's not the number of words that matters, it's what are the actual words in the context in which they're used, and we don't know that part yet. That's what we're trying to figure out. Neil, uh, I think you hit the point. Uh, as I am focusing on the brain uh, data bank side, to me, AI is really a group effort. You got to get a group of brains working together. So how difficult is it to get a group of brains together in your system? That's a real challenge. Uh, it, it is, and it's despite all our talk about team and collaboration, we're not used to having you know, a diverse set of, of teams to do some of these things. I, I tell people like when you want to use, build like a really robust AI solution, yeah, you need some good technologists, you need some domain experts, but you probably need some linguists, some psychologists, 
you know, people that can bring some different perspectives in, depending on what you're doing. If you're working with children, you know, you, you probably need some child therapists. You probably need people from different backgrounds, socioeconomic, nationality, all these things to actually build a true robust training set for the AI. That's a lot of work. How's it near for the talk? Uh, so back to your question, the question that Kevin gave very early on on Alexa, right? I mean, I think obviously the, the uh, limitation of Alexa doesn't retain that context of the conversation. So it fails to Turing test. Uh, so how far do you think we are in having an AI that can actually pass that Turing test? And what's the value? So, uh, interesting question. So he's asking, like, how far do we think we are from an AI passing the Turing test, and what's the barrier? It depends on which Turing test you're talking about. There's actually more than one. And we've actually seen some AI actually pass some of the Turing tests, but not all of them. Again, it's a moving definition of what is really AI. Um, until we agree upon one Turing test, I don't, that's probably the biggest barrier right now is what's that one Turing test to actually say that. But total, the little tangential we're talking about, uh, a good example of something like this actually is in the movie Ex Machina. Has anyone ever seen that movie? Yeah. It's a great movie, not kid friendly though, but it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I do, I do highly recommend it. But you have this kind of eerie feeling when you're watching it because it's, a, it's actually a Turing test. And the way it's constructed all these things, it's, it's pretty well thought out and it's a little bit scary. But when you watch the movie, you have this creepy feeling. And at some point, it'll dawn on you that as I'm watching this movie, all these things that are going on, all this work that these people are doing, someone is actually doing that right now in the real world. So. Concept of AI in healthcare further, especially with the training data used to visualize whether it's cancers or not. How do you then prevent the AI from using various purposes? Should it become self aware and pass the Turing test? So no one's actually worried about that right now because what you're talking about is called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And we're nowhere close to having that right now. Maybe, you know, everyone says 10 years, 50 years, never, we, we don't know. But we're so far away from that right now that that's not really a concern. Today we only have what's called ANI, Artificial Narrow Intelligence, which means the AI can only do what we've actually taught it to do, and it's passive. It doesn't do anything unless we ask it to do something. So for example, AlphaGo Zero, even though it's a great champion in the game Go and chess, it's not just sitting there in its idle time going like, hmm, I want to learn about cars. You can't do that. So will we ever hit the point you're talking about? Um, I don't know, but I believe in the cyborg feature. I think we're actually moving towards human-machine integration that I think we're probably going to become cyborgs before AI ever actually achieves sentience or consciousness, right? We've already seen that happen with the artificial limb, with the digital cameras, there's actually some other things going on. I feel like we're very much moving to that cyborg future. Uh, asking about coding, open source AI projects, what I find interesting and why. Uh, good question. Um, there's obviously a lot of tools out there, a lot of APIs made for use by all the big companies, you know, Microsoft, Alibaba, Amazon, IBM, Google. Um, there's an organization called OpenAI that's actually trying to uh, help social entrepreneurs use technolo technology to uh, well, obviously, the social enterprise would do good things, <clears throat> and they, they back it up with mentors, uh, resources, funding, and those types of things. Um, they're looking at things like trying to actually cure some diseases like malaria, um, was it chicken pox, things like that. What I'm actually more, more interested in is the area of artificial empathy. So even though that machines don't feel the emotion, they can dynamically detect it in a person and respond appropriately. 
So if they're having like a really happy conversation, joking around, then some of that person gets angry, they recognize that, and they'll become very soothing, try and calm the person down. And there's actually an initiative called Loving AI, uh, in partnership with a couple of universities, as well as Hanson Robotics, where they're trying to teach a machine this concept of unconditional love. All right? Could a machine you know, unconditionally love a person. And the reason they're doing this is that the biggest loneliness, or sorry, the biggest disease in the world, or illness in the world, is loneliness. And about 40% of the, of the people in the world suffer from some moderate to severe form of loneliness and depression. And so they think we create this 24-7 comp companion that's never gonna get frustrated with you, it's always available, and will never judge you. And so that, that's one area I'm really fascinated by because while they're trying to do this, it's become this kind of deep spiritual reflection in what it means to be human. Because what is unconditional love? How do you define that? Right? Remember what I said. You can only teach an AI something that we've commoditized. Is unconditional love commoditized? Right? What, what's the difference between unconditional love and love? So it's turned into this really deep philosophical kind of social thing now, making us actually look very much inwards to ourselves. And I actually believe that one of the unique things we will probably get out of AI is it's going to give us actually more time to understand what it is to be human. You know, a lot of people always ask me, is this the century of the machine? I actually believe this is going to be the century of the human. That we're going to have machines to help us free up some time, we can work on more complex things, more value add things, but we actually have more time to kind of reflect on what it means to be human. What is the human condition? And I think that's a really unique opportunity for us. Uh, all, all the time, right? So something you're talking about is explainable AI. Unfortunately, a lot of people that build AI tools are building things they don't fully understand. So if an AI comes back with a, a recommendation or an answer, and like it's like, where did that come from? They don't build the capability to explain its logic. Some, some companies do do that, like IBM Watson does do that, right? And even those that do sometimes don't want to share how to arrive, they don't want to give up the secret sauce because when it comes to AI, you don't really patent things, it's trade secrets around the data, around the training, and they don't want to give that up. And that, that's become a problem. So I was actually talking to some people earlier today. Um, I actually teach a law class, even though I'm not a lawyer, I went to law school, um, at UC Irvine. And last semester, because um, I, I, I do group projects, I had one group, they did a project where they actually wrote legislation for the California legislature. It was actually Senate Bill 444. And what they actually had proposed the legislation was, if you're a contractor that's doing business with the state of California and something bad does happen for whatever you've done for the state of California using AI, you would have to reveal the, how it got trained or explain what happened. Um, unfortunately, that bill was killed. I won't go into that. But there have been attempts to at least legally or regulatory policy-wise do something like that. But that's, that's a deeper question around you know, truth and trust and technology and what's our role as people in society to regulate or monitor that. every MRI, these are all digital information that is are available. Are you saying, like, for example, this is an example, Oak Hospital is not willing to share that information? That, that is correct. Data is, the new, data is the new oil. So you have all these organizations that, even if they don't know how to use the data that they have, or can't use the data they have, just don't want to give it away. Right? Because they think that if I do that, someone else is going to profit off my information. 
that's become the attitude. And so there's no, there's not a lot of sharing. They're not, they're not actually worried about replacing them. They just, they just don't want to share the data, at least not without compensation. And they think people overvalue the data that they have. So they, if they are willing to license, they often, they often ask for an outrageous sum of money. Yeah. And there is no government interaction? Not in the United States. Not a problem in China, though. <laughs> Well, I, I, I talk about what I call the three E's, education, empowerment, and enablement. So well, we have to make people, help them understand what's going on and how they can be part of it. So we got, then we gotta empower them to feel like they can actually do something. This is not the Googles of the world or Facebooks of the world off doing stuff and you don't have to live with it. We each can kind of shape that future, that destiny, so we have to make people understand how they can actually do that. And the last is enablement, actually give them the, the tools, the resources, the partnerships, the ecosystem, the funding, whatever it might be, to actually enact on that vision. One, one big thing I'm very passionate about actually is education because the, we, all know, we all talk about the future of work and we all know it's gonna change, but it's happening much and much faster than people are realizing. And so our, our runway to enact real change is shrinking. So to be able to retrain part of the existing workforce, because we can't retrain them all, unfortunately, that, that pathway, every day we lose, X number of people are gonna be get, get cut out. And the future of work, the longer that we wait, the more and more students are gonna fall into the same trap. And I'm very big about we need to kind of modernize our curriculum and understand that in the world of tomorrow, we just don't need a bunch of really smart technologists and engineers and data scientists. We do need those people, but we also need philosophers and artists, right? If you're gonna entrust a machine to make a decision for you, especially when lives are involved, we have to now proactively think about things, not be reactive. We have to go through these thought exercises like self-driving cars, where different scenarios can play out. It's very much a philosophical exercise. The other thing is, things are gonna be about experiences, right? Like all Nippon Airways is investing heavily in VR because they know people are probably not gonna take vacations anymore. They're an airline investing in VR, and they realize it's all gonna be about the experience, how we engage with whether it's AI, or laptop, or mobile device, whatever it is, is what's gonna set things apart. And how do we motivate and influence people and their behaviors? Well, art's a great motivator. It's a great way to create these experiences. And that's why I think if we had one thing to really focus on, it's that aspect of education. Would Christian be the former part of the evening, so I'd like to thank our speaker.